Welcome everyone, my name is Thomas Schutenhelm and I'm the Artistic Director at Network for New Music. And today we have two special people with us for an interview. We have composer Richard Broadhead and pianist Clipper Erickson. Welcome to the both of you. I'm so glad to have you here on our first interview of the 2022-23 season, which we're calling Renewal as we're all pleased to be back to in-person concerts. And I have you here today because we, on our first concert, we're featuring two works by Richard Broadhead. And I would like to talk with you a little bit about the premiere performance of your Piano Sonata number no. 3. Now, since we have this as number 3, I wanted to ask you as a lead-in, uh, about your other piano sonatas and how this sonata fits into your catalog. Uh, well, that's great, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, for having us. Uh, um, my uh, my first I didn't write my first sonata until about two thousand and six. It was a uh, Philadelphia Chamber Music Society commission. Uh, and uh, performed uh, by uh, Charles Abramovic, premiered by Charles Abramovic. Um, and uh, it was uh, it was very much, uh, I, I subtitled it Sonata Classica because it involved a number of Baroque and classical approaches, forms, techniques, including a fugue, a double fugue, a passacaglia, and so forth. That's a big, big piece, about 26 minutes. And then um, the second sonata is really, in a sense, part of a three-work series that I wrote specifically for Clipper. Uh, Clipper and I got to know one another. I'm uh, correct me, Clipper. It must have been around 2010, 2011. That's about. That's about it. Right. When and you did the the sonatina you did in. Right. That's right. And you know, Clipper was at that point, uh, I think, deeply in involved with his doctoral program. He was a doctoral student, but I had known of him and known of his wonderful work actually for decades. I first saw his name and heard about him in the early to mid 80s. And I think Clipper, you were, it was, a, you were part of a, was it a Steinway um, project in those days? Or um, I forget the organization that you were involved with. Do you, does, does any of that come back to you? Well, point. there were a couple of things where our paths crossed. One was the, the radio show that was going on that um, Alexander Fiorillo yeah. did. Yes, that's right. He had you on that show and he yes, had me yeah. on that show back yes, up, yeah. up in the studio in Roxborough when that was still going on. I remember that well, yes. But I knew of you even before that when I was at the New School of Music and knew of your, your artistry. And then we really met and had a chance to get to know one another around 2011. And you were very good. You were very kind and asked me to write you a piece. So I wrote my Tango Sonatina, um, which Clipper has given uh, many performances of, did a terrific, terrific job. And I followed that up in conjunction with a what ended up, I guess, being a two CD set for Novona with mm -hmm. my Sonata number no. two, also written specifically for him. And he recorded both the Sonatina and the Sonata for, for Novona. So, uh, you know, it, I mean, we worked so well together. He's such a wonderful artist. He's a joy to work with. He's a friend. He, he he knows my music so that many questions don't really need to be asked. And so um, when I went back and decided to write another sonata, I was I was delighted to run it past him to see if he wanted to be 
uh, to, to be involved and so forth? He said, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. And here we are. Yeah. <laughs> And Clipper, you you are very well known for for championing a lot of underrepresented composers, and uh, also your dedication to contemporary music. So I wonder if you could just share with us, like, how did you go about preparing this piece for its premiere? Well, it's still, of course, a work in progress. Here we are, something like three weeks before. So the the the, the general way I just approach it where what I would do with with any work with any major work with with understanding the scope and the form of the piece and reading it through and then digging into the details and mastering the challenges and then putting it back and putting it back together and playing it for the composer and that's it's it's like the the way the the only difference is is that I don't have I don't have recordings to go to but that's probably a good thing because I don't like to learn even, even older pieces by listening to recordings and copying somebody that I like. I have to wrestle it with it on my own in order to make, in order to make it mine. So it's really what I, what I enjoy doing all the time. So the fact that it's a new work doesn't necessarily mean that it's a different process. Right. And I, I think both of you have, have alluded to this nature of it being a, a, a major work. And, and we know that yeah. the piano itself comes, you know, there, there are a lot of major pieces written for that uh, p, uh, instrument. So Richard, I, I'm wondering if you could just, just talk to us about the, the importance of this piece and the, the piano in, in your output. Well, you know, it's 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 almost a surprise to me that the piano has figured so uh, prominently. I mean, I now have three sonatas. I have a whole uh, a group of of suites and smaller pieces, not to mention uh, works for ensemble that include substantial parts for piano. I am myself only a hack pianist. I Well, you must be a pretty good hack pianist. I, I, I've, all, I've said for years, and I think it's true, Clipper, that no self-respecting bar would ever empl employ me as a pianist at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just really not a, a good pianist. What I seem to have been able to do, and I say that only because I... Uh, wonderful pianist whose work I respect greatly have said so, is that I seem to have an understanding of what is idiomatic for the instrument. Very much so. It's very rare. I, I play a lot of new music and usually one of the one of the things that I run up against is that it just doesn't sound well on the instrument. It's like you you transcribe something for another medium into the piano. You have such a, an, an ear and a knack for piano texture. And, well, and that's a rare thing. And You're, Richard, how did you develop that? Did, 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 do you think that came from study? Was it maybe a part of, you know, sort of an intuitive approach? What, what, what is it like to, to look at that blank page and approach a new piano piece? Well, um, I, the thing that I try to keep in mind, whether it's a piano piece or uh, any kind of work or any instrument or group is, um, what is it that the piece wants to be? Mm -hmm. That's more important than what I want the piece to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I have greatest control at the beginning, but as you be as you become more and more involved with the piece, as the, the number of me completed measures uh, increase, you actually the composer has less and less control. The piece begins to assert its own identity. So that's something for any piece that I really try to to listen listen to what the piece wants to be and do. That having been said, I try, and this I think is maybe something that comes with a certain degree of age, I really 
I want to be certain when I begin a piece for piano that my material is natural to the instrument, that it speaks with the voice of the instrument. Um, you know, I, the, the, the most awful thing would be, uh, you know, to write a piece for piano that really wants to be a string quartet or or yes. something else, you know, or, or to write a string quartet that really wants to be a piano piece. Um, so I, I really try to, to, to think about that and contemplate that as I'm coming up with material. And then if I'm, if, if I succeed, there's always a risk, but if I succeed, then in fact, if that, if that material really is piano material, then what it want will end up being will be a piano piece and I will follow what it tells me it wants to do without a lot of fear, I think, that it's going to move beyond the bounds of uh, the, the capability and the voice of the instrument. Yes, and and presumably you you've been listening to piano for your entire career, and so to, to to have that both mix of study and an intuitive approach, and and I I love your notion here of like creating material for the piano that is that is resonant uh, of of the very nature of the instrument, and so. Clipper, since we're we're talking about piano music, I and and Richard was saying that uh, he's not quite a player. I thought this would be a great time to talk to you as as a professional and a virtuoso on the instrument. And if if you could maybe just speak to us about your tell us a little bit about your background and your training as a pianist and how you came to have such an interest in contemporary music. Well, I. I think that interest comes from the most influential teacher that I had in my youth, and that was John Ogden. Yes. I studied with John Ogden at Indiana University in the late 70s, and I owe him really pretty much everything that I am, like curiosity. The man could just play anything, and every week I would come and he would have some new score by some composer on the on the piano that he was getting involved in. And it was just like endless curiosity and acquiring of repertoire. And also the, the incredible gift of being able to, to play literally anything. So I, I had that really as a model to be curious and to constantly want to explore new things rather than just play the same repertoire that all the other pianists around play, which you hear a lot of you know, the same pieces get played and, and that's, that's not what I'm about. You know, whether it's new music or old music or whatever, I'm very much into searching. And, and this is a particularly special piece because it's, it's written with you in mind and or at least you in, in, in the ear. And as much as Richard forms the material, there's also the performer who gets to shape the performance. So if I was wondering, Clipper, if you just tell us more about your, your approaches to interpretation. And interpretation, particularly of a new work, it's almost like what you're doing is you're, you're a midwife. You're like, you're present at, you're in charge and you're helping the birth of a new thing, of a new creation, a new, a new world of sound. And it's, it, it flows through you. When you, when you perform something like that. And there's always experimentation. There's like, try this, try that. I wonder whether Richard would like this if I do it this way or what. But, and, but the advantage of course, is that you have the composer to talk to. Mm -hmm. You know, so many times you wish, I wish I could call Beethoven up on the phone and ask him like, what word did you mean by when you wrote this? But here you can. And that's a, a real gift. And it's a very exciting thing to do. And and when I was reading through this piece, I was very moved by the second movement, especially. And I said that right in at the beginning when I was talking to Richard about this, about how marvelous this this movement is, that it's really the center point of the whole piece. The the emotional and the mysterious deep quality of it is was immediately striking. 
Yes, and I think that that is worthy of underlining is is Richard the the poeticisms, uh, that that sort of deep music that Clipper was referring to that 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 I think runs throughout your music. Um, it's very that's very kind of you. On um, you uh, mentioned something that um, uh, strikes me that our that our listeners might be be interested in. This piece has been, in some respects, baked for decades. The, mm -hmm. the subtitle of the piece is Palimpsest. Mm -hmm. And uh, a palimpsest is, uh, is essentially a, a, a piece of writing. It's usually parchment, where if you take off the writing that's on top, you find that there's writing underneath. Well, in a sense, this is a piece written on top of music mm -hmm. written 40 years ago and reshaped in substantial ways, though some passages are verbatim. I wrote a piece uh, about 40 years ago. I was never quite, it was never premiered. I didn't write it as a commission. I just wrote it. But I was never quite convinced that it was what it wanted to be. And so I let it sit little knowing that it would sit for about 40 years. And when I went back to it, I tore it apart. I kept a lot of the same material, but I moved things from movement to movement. I did all kinds of things and created a new piece, mm -hmm. but using a great deal of old material. What that has actually allowed me to do is to allow that original material to gestate mm -hmm. years. And I actually think that it has improved and strengthened the, it, it's allowed me to understand the expressive potential in the material. And if in fact, Clipper sees in this um, a depth of emotion you see in it, I think to some extent it's because of all those many years of gestation and baking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. And I, I just love the notion of, of palimpsest um, and as even as it applies to, to performance, because I mean, having someone like you, Clipper, who has played you know, the, the canon of, of piano repertoire can bring to a new piece a depth of understanding that you're almost like seeing through uh, all of the other pieces and, and, and mapping onto this new piece, uh, something, something vital and contemporary. Well, the, the thing that struck me about what Richard was saying now, of course, I don't know what the original piece was. So all the, the background of the, the first layer on the parchment, I don't know what that is. So I'm looking at what you have created now. And what I'm seeing is that it is very firmly rooted in the great works of the past. And the creative process that you're, that you're talking about is also rooted in, in the great works of the past. So they're really, when we say, well, it's new music, but they're really, it's really old music. It's made, <laughs> It's made the old way, but it's just, it has new material. But the, the way you work a piece and the way you, you create is, is really universal and very old. Mm -hmm. And with reworking old materials, I mean, people like in the, in the Renaissance period did that all the time. Like take something that, and then rework something that they wrote before and then change it around and make something new out of it. That, that's like, that's a, an old, old process. I, I'm finding, by the way, interestingly enough in this, I'm finding that I'm doing things like that a great deal these days. A whole series of works either incorporate material from earlier works uh, that may or may not have been finished or sketches or whatever, or are, or, or are in some ways rooted in it. It's frankly, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm now 75. It's an advantage to getting older. You've written more music. There's more to draw from. There's more to, in a sense, learn from. And in some cases, there are more things to improve. 
Yeah, it's it's, ne it's a never ending process. The it's other, since I have a, a pretty strong background in keyboard literature, I'm always interested in looking at new music and saying, how is this like things that happened before? And what strikes me is that how traditional and how classical it is in, in the way the movements proceed and in the way they relate to each other. So many of the, it's, it's like Beethoven. If Beethoven lived now, then this is what, is what he would write. It starts with an introdu introductory like material, like so many Beethoven sonatas. And then you have a sonata allegro, and then you have a slow movement that's sort of the emotional centerpiece. And then you have a, a joyful con brio, somewhat humorous last movement. And the, it's like, how many Beethoven sonatas are like that? <laughs> and we're all greatly looking forward to hearing this, this premiere. Um, I did, since you were talking about uh, time and noting that we're still somewhat in this era of the pandemic and wanting to be careful, uh, we also know that um, on the program, it, we're going to have uh, the in-person premiere of Richard, your, your piece called Idol, yeah. um, which was premiered during the pandemic uh, with players who were not together and then uh, put together, but it also features the piano. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to visit that piece a little bit. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about Idol. Uh, yes, th this, is, this is a piece that I, I wrote uh, uh, a couple of years ago for the uh, the Temple University New Music Ensemble, uh, which is conducted by our own uh, network conductor, Jan Krzywicki, whom I've known and worked with. He's a colleague and friend of, of decades. Um, and uh, he, he asked me to write a, 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 a piece. And I began working um, with the material and it, it is in some respects a very pastoral piece, though it's interrupted with some pretty jagged and rhythmic uh, material uh, as well. And I realized as I was writing the piece, and this was in early 2020, this was my reaction in some respects, at the time, my unknowing reaction that became more clear to me, my reaction to the pandemic. Mm. It was in some respects uh, uh, a, 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 uh, an attempt to uh, embody a kind of idyllic escapist mm -hmm. atmosphere but with, I would say, a, a, a sorrowful sense that there was no escape, <laughs> uh, desirable as it may be, to have it. And um, that really, as the piece was, as I was writing it, and it became clearer and clearer to me as I was writing that the environment in which we were living was, was really having a very specific influence on some of the choices I was making um, and so forth in the, in the piece. Um, I, I, just, I just realized it was shaping the piece in some respects. It, it shaped the initial material. It was there in the original material. And as that material fleshed out as it wished to be, uh, I, I found it more and more. And uh, so it became my uh, my co compositional response to the to the pandemic. Yeah, and I'm I'm just curious, did you um, it, did you find it easy or difficult to write during the pandemic? In some respects, <clears throat> I mean the pandemic, sure cast a, a, a level of anxiety over, over all of us uh, in various ways that we know and probably in a whole lot of ways that were unconscious, subliminal. Mm -hmm. if, there, if there's a silver lining in the isolation that, that you know, we, we had to go through, it was that I, 
I got a lot of composing time. <laughs> um, there was very, very, there were very few distractions. And so in that sense, there was a degree of, um, there was the time and atmosphere for contemplation of really feeling and hearing the way the piece wanted to unfold. Um, and, and, it, and the compositional process was also a way to cope with the pandemic. Yeah. So I, 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 my productivity did not flag during that time. It, it uh, uh, if anything, it may have increased somewhat. Mm. Um, and well, uh, it certainly, as I say, influenced all the music that I was writing during that period. And Clipper, you you presented a lot of online events during the the pandemic. Could you tell us a little bit about what you did during that time? And because you remained sort of singularly dedicated to to giving concerts during that period. Well, I had a similar experience as Richard. It it sort it sort of increased my activity, but in a different way because it removed a lot of distractions. Mm -hmm. um, so at the very beginning of the pan, when the shutdowns first started, um, I, in, of course, everything that I had planned to do in the next several months was all gone. So I figured that, okay, we have to find a new way to do things because people need music. They need music now more than ever. So the music can't stop. We need to, we need to get it out there. So at the, at the beginning, I found a videographer friend of mine and I went to a piano store, which was the only piano store I could find that would actually open its doors for me to go in there. We hooked up to a wonky internet that kept me coming out and you know, going in and out. And I played a concert live from, from there. And the response was huge. Like people said, we need this, you need to keep doing this. And I called the, the program Music for the Soul. And that sort of developed into a whole idea that expanded on my interests, which are to, um, to put music by composers of color and women together with famous masterworks. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of morphed into, we'll make it into a series. And it's sort of generated its own momentum where I have, now I have singers and string players coming and collaborating with me and we do, do with these programs of, of all the, these interesting interesting pieces and we now we're doing them live and broadcasting them while we're doing it so i guess they call that hybrid now and, and i was extremely lucky to find somebody who knows all the ins and outs of all the tech and the the social media like how to get this stuff out hit out there so i was just very very fortunate to find somebody like that and uh, th this it's been really kind of the prized thing that I've been able to start in the pandemic. So it shows that you can start new things, even in a time of crisis mm -hmm. and you know, everything being totally different, that you can't you don't have to just shut yourself into a hole and hope it all blows over. You can actually start something new. Well, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear from the both of you that during some dark times, you were able to find the, the energy and the force to, to keep making great music. And our audiences are going to be really pleased to hear uh, both the Piano Sonata Number no. 3 and Idol on our very first concert on Sunday, October 16th at 3 p.m. at the Settlement Music School and a repeat performance at Haverford University uh, on Monday, October 17th. So I hope you'll join us and you can always visit the website to get your tickets. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Clipper. It was great to speak with you today. Thank you, Thomas, for putting this together. It's, I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be really a marvelous concert. Thank Thanks you, everyone. Thank you.